Hi, everyone, and welcome to the NCAT webinar, Five Guidelines to Improve Soil Health and Water Holding Capacity. My name is Colin Mitchell, and I'm joined by my colleague, Kara Kroger, and we're both sustainable agriculture specialists at the National Center for Appropriate Technology, which, uh, to be honest, is kind of a mouthful, so most people just know us as NCAT. Uh, we both work out of our Southwest office in San Antonio, Texas. NCAT is a nationwide nonprofit organization with five regional headquarters across the country. And sorry, y'all, I'm trying to change slides here. Okay. Um, NCAT is a nation, nationwide nonprofit organization with five regional headquarters across the country. Uh, we have locations in Arkansas, Mississippi, California, New Hampshire, and Texas with our headquarters in Montana. We work on issues pertaining to sustainable agriculture, sustainable energy, and sustainable communities. I want to give a special thanks to NCAT, ATRA, and our IT staff at NCAT for making this all possible. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on NCAT's ATRA webpage and on our YouTube channel. ATRA, our sustainable agriculture program, is funded through a cooperative agreement with the USDA Rural Business Cooperative Service, and we're grateful for their support as well. So ATRA offers a wide range of services to sustainable ag producers, including publications, toll-free helplines, and webinars. You can check it out for yourself after the webinar on the ATRA website, www.atra.ncat.org. So as far as introductions, um, I received my Bachelor of Arts from the University of Texas at Austin in government uh, with a minor in geography and the environment. I'm a Texas Hill Country native hailing from Bernie, Texas, I received my formal sustainable agriculture training during a nine month project management internship at the Permaculture Research Institute of Australia. And I'm a Permaculture Research Institute certified permaculture designer. After completing my internship, I went on to work on and manage sustainable agriculture and development projects in Central Texas and in the Western United States. I work on a wide array of projects at NCAT related to soil health, adaptive multi paddock grazing, local food, carbon sequestration, payment programs for ecosystem services, real crop production, and agroforestry. So my colleague, Kara Koger, is also a sustainable agriculture specialist at NCAT, and she earned her bachelor's in general agriculture at Texas State University, graduating in 2018. With a background in grass-fed beef production, she is knowledgeable in the use of regenerative management tools to improve pasture health and productivity. Her work includes developing and managing the NCAT Soil for Water Initiative, which aims to create a critical mass of landowners who are applying regenerative agriculture practices. Additionally, Kara became a certified herbalist at the Rocky Mountain Center for Botanical Studies in 1999, a certified nutritionist at the American Health Science University in 2003, and started training as a chef in 2009 with renowned chef Jesse Griffiths of Die Dewey. She has owned Foundation Culinary, a nutritional consulting and private chef business since 2009. So there are a couple of thing, other things we'd like to point out before we get started. First, you'll see a questions field on the screen where you can write questions during the webinar. We will be collecting the questions and we will answer a number of them towards the end of the webinar. Uh, don't be shy about asking questions. If you ask a question and it is not answered during the webinar, we will answer it and all the questions we get via email in the days to come. In fact, if you think of a question after the webinar or about any sustainable agriculture question, look for the Ask an Ag Expert contact information on the actual website. Also, at the end of the webinar, you'll receive a short survey. Please take a few minutes to answer the survey. It helps us make future webinars as effective and helpful as we can. Now I'm going to pass it off to Kara, and she'll tell you more about our Soil for Water initiative. <clears throat> Thank you, Colin. And hello, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us today. Trying to switch the slide. All right. So a significant part of my work at NCAT is the management of the Soil for Water Initiative, as Colin mentioned. And we are an initiative that is trying to catch and hold more water in the soil. And as Colin mentioned, we're creating a critical mass of landowners applying regenerative ag practices that improve soil health and water cycles. So the Soil for Water initiative was the idea of a holistic management international certified educator and livestock producer, Peggy Sechrist. And as many of you may remember, during the 2011 drought, many livestock producers suffered great economic and environmental losses due to poor soil health, 
overgrazed pastures, and very broken water cycles. So Peggy's understanding of holistic management and its effectiveness in increasing resiliency inspired her to approach NCAT in 2015 as a partner for the Soil for Water initiative. So we're now five years into the initiative and we have gained a lot of traction. And we engage our participants in three main ways. Firstly, we have 15 ranches in Central Texas participating in regenerative agriculture research trials, looking at how different grazing management practices improve pasture health, soil infiltration, and water holding capacity. And we plan to continue these studies for a minimum of six years. We also offer educational outreach like today's webinar on topics like soil health and monitoring, pasture or cover cropping, and many other interesting topics that help our mission. And last but not least, we also facilitate peer-to-peer -peer networking opportunities, particularly before in-person work workshops, um, which hopefully we can do again soon, and through other avenues such as our recent collaboration with Holistic Management International on the Regenerative Ag Mentorship Program, which I can tell you more about. If you would like to learn um, more, uh, you can call me. So if you're interested in learning more about the Soil for Water Initiative, you can view our website at soilforwater.org. We have some great management resources on our resource page, and you can learn about upcoming events there as well. Sorry, we have slow, slow slide turning here. So the Soil for Water program rests on the foundation of these five soil health principles listed here. And today I wanna to share with you how these five principles can benefit overall ag production as well as increase soil infiltration and water holding capacity. So let's take a minute to discuss regenerative agriculture and its ability to create really resiliency. Unfortunately, the ag practices of the past century have mostly taken a reductionist approach and that has oversimplified complex biological processes to the point of minimizing and distorting them. For instance, soil microbiology was rarely considered important in conventional agriculture prior to 1990, even though soil, soil microbiology makes up 95% of life on land. So I wanna repeat that. Soil microbiology makes up 95% of life on land. So farming became focused on adding chemical inputs that reduce soil's natural function and health. And we lost sight of the whole picture as we placed our focus on increasing yields. So we're now seeing the negative effects that conventional farming and urbanization of rural lands have caused for water cycles, soil microbiology, and overall soil health and its ability to catch and hold rainwater. So many agriculturalists, fortunately, are becoming more aware that the parts of the whole are intimately connected and much greater than the sum of their parts. So such as in the importance of soil microbiology, the interconnectedness of things becomes apparent when we examine how the loss of biodiversity we are experiencing can affect the whole planet negatively. So more producers come to understand the importance of looking at their production practices from a holistic view and just how much this perspective can help us create regenerative and resilient agricultural systems. So let me give you a quick reminder regarding the physical, chemical, and biological components of soil. So we'll start with parent materials, which are clay, silt, and sand. And these parent materials are made through weathering and microbiology, breaking down rocks. Next, we have soil organic matter. And organic matter is the waste residue and metabolites from animals, plants, and microbes, AKA dead things, and is very, very important in soil infiltration and water holding capacity, as well as many other important soil functions. The cation exchange capacity is an aspect of soil chemistry that reflects soil fertility and function. Soil pH affects many chemical processes in the soil, but specifically plant nutrient availability. And the optimum range for most plants is between 5.5 and 7.5. Porosity is also very important and porosity is considered the highways of the soil which is gonna allow for air and water flow into the soil to facilitate cation exchange and allow microbes to flourish. Many of these highways are, are made by earthworms and arthropods and soil aggregation created by fungal and bacterial microbiology. 
It's worth noting that soil microbiology plays the biggest role in soil health out of all the functions listed in the previous slide. Sorry, I'm trying to change the slide. Here we go. Um, so yes, it is, it is the most important um, of all the factors listed in the previous slide. And without microbiology, you have dirt, not soil. So two important functions in soil are available water capacity and soil infiltration. And that's a big point of the, the big topic today. And so let me explain what these two things are. So first, soil infiltration refers to the ability of the soil to allow water to move into and through the soil profile. Infiltration allows the soil to temporarily store water, making it available for plants and soil organisms. And the infiltration rate is, major, is a measure of how fast water enters the soil, which is typically expressed in inches per hour or inches per minute, depending on who's doing the test. So the soil texture or the percentage of the sand, silt, or clay in the soil is the major inherent factor affecting infiltration. So water is going to move more quickly through the large pores of a sandy soil than it will through the small pores of a clay soil, especially if the clay has been compacted and has little to no structure or aggregation. Available water capacity is the maximum amount of plant available water a soil can provide. So this is an indicator of the soil's ability to retain water and make it sufficiently available for plant use. So a big factor for improving the function of both of these things is soil organic, soil organic matter. So please remember, organic matter comprised mostly of carbon holds 18 to 20 times its weight in water and recycles nutrients for plant use. So keep in mind that 1% increase in organic matter in the top six inches of soil can hold approximately 25,000 gallons of water per acre. So I'm gonna turn it over to Colin now to discuss the first soil health principle. All right, um, so keeping your covers or your soil covered is an important first step. The US loses on average 5.8 tons of soil per acre per year. If you see soil blowing in the wind or in the water running off the land, then that's soil loss. Covering the soil, first of all, prevents that water and wind erosion, whether it's through mulch or cover crop. Cover crops are crops planted on your farmland or pasture and you do not harvest them. They are there to cover the soil and improve soil health. Also, by covering the soil, you are creating a more water efficient environment. Mulch and cover crops reduce heat and evaporation by creating a shaded buffer between the sun and warmer air and the cooler soil below the cover. This cover will allow a rainfall to create more available water to your plants. All right, and, oops, sorry guys. Covering your soil also reduces compaction caused by rain events. When soil is exposed and a harder rain comes, these raindrops not only cause compacted divots where the rainfall strikes, but also loosen soil. The lo this loosened soil will flow off when we uh, when a rough rain falls. And the greater the slope, the easier it is for the loosened soil from the rain stri rainfall strike to flow off. You can see this in the bottom left-hand picture, the kind of dispersal pattern that happens when that rainfall strike happens. It's not only compacting, but displacing soil. And covering your soil also suppresses weed growth by limiting sunlight to germinated seeds. This helps reduce competition between the crops, trees, or planted pollinators. In more arid scenarios, weeds are taking water from your crops, and every little bit is precious in our arid and semi-arid climates. Mulch or well-timed cover crop planting can help break this cycle. Also keeping the soil covered because it is great because it helps provide habitat for above and below ground soil organisms. A healthy soil has a balanced food web and is alive. Another important reason to keep your soil covered in our Texas heat is that it buffers soil temperature, especially the heat. When it's mid-August and it's 108 degrees, your soil will be at a much higher temperature due to the color of the actual soil. Think about a black car in the sun. Your soil typically is in a redder to browner or blacker color, so it's going to heat up a little bit more than the ambient air temperature when it's in direct sunlight. Think about the feeling when you're out in the field and it feels like your feet are cooking in your, bo uh, in your boots. That's what's happening in your soil. Just like you and your skin doesn't like direct um, sunlight in the summertime, neither does your soil. 
um, that UV will break up uh, soil micro microorganisms, but also that direct sunlight heats up your soil. And as you can see on the slide, um, when you get at 100 degrees, which is going to happen here in Texas at some point, 85% um, of your moisture is lost. And then at 115, um, your microbes begin to break down. And that's really not that hard in the summer. Again, think about getting in your car and how hot it is. Same thing with your soil on the ground. It can reach much higher than the ambient air temperature. And then once you reach 140, you basically have sterile soil, or as I like to call it, dirt. It's not soil anymore if it's not alive. So covering your soil is important to keeping it alive. And now I'm going to pass it off to Kara. All right, thanks, Colin. Let's go ahead and look at the second soil health principle of increasing biodiversity. So biodiversity is, the, is a variety of all forms of life, both within and above the soil. And in the image on the right, you can see the biodiversity web uh, in action here. Everything feeds off another, and when you remove one piece of that equation, it creates changes. So I want to share a study with you done by the Food and Resource Economics Department at the University of British Columbia. They studied whether natural biodiversity helped buffer farmers against weather shocks. And they found that farmers in areas with greater biodiversity took less of an income hit from droughts than their peers who farmed amid less diversity. So their calculations also indicated that a loss of half of the species within a region would double the impact of weather extremes on their income. The study suggests that the beneficial effect most likely stemmed from having multiple alternative pollinators and numerous beneficial insects. So when we have high biodiversity, we improve the likelihood of following uh, of the following ecosystem functions. Get hit the slide to shift here. There we go. And we have the lovely Ladybird Johnson, who was a big proponent of creating biodiversity of the Texas wildflowers. So that's a lovely picture of her there. So yes, let's go back to. Um, improving ecosystem function. So uh, predation is basically the fact that each trophic level feeds off each other. And when this happens, they become available nutrients for the plants again via the excrement of their predators. Symbiosis is the close relationship of two dissimilar organisms. And symbiosis can be mutualistic where both benefit, commensalistic where one benefits and the other is not harmed, and parasitic where one organism is harmed at the sake of the other. Uh, nutrient cycles happen simultaneously and are intertwined with one another. The life cycles of all the different organisms, both within and above the soil, fuel and drive the movement of all plants, plant nutrients. So carbon and nitrogen fixation is also very important in the soil. And it's good to remember that organic carbon, organic nitrogen, and available water always move together. So soil carbon as soil carbon increases, so too will organic nitrogen. So it's important to encourage biodiversity through providing rangeland, wetland, riparian, and wildlife habitat whenever possible. And some of the tools we can use are included on this next slide. Hopefully it will come up soon. Uh, I'll go ahead and start talking about them. So the first is uh, a windbreak or a shelter belt. And the goal with this is to reduce wind erosion and protect growing plants, particularly crops and forage. They can also manage snow and improve irrigation efficiency. And my slide is not turning here. Colin, could you try going to the next slide for me, please? Yeah, happy to. Thank you. So additionally, thank you. Additionally, um, prescribed burns can be useful as well. Um, and they can be used to remove excess residue and plant species that prevent good species from growing. So this is a good example of this is small cedar saplings that we want to get rid of so they don't grow into large plants. And also in ungrazed prairies, we can remove residues this way and make way for other plant species to come in. We can also plant prairie species um, 
And if the native seed bank in the soil is absent or you want to just speed up the native plant growth in general, you can plant the native seed mixes for your region, uh, both riparian or prairie species, and those can be very helpful as well. Um, pasture cropping is another thing that is helpful, and this creates a temporary competitive niche in the root ecology of a perennial pasture that enables the optimal growth of a planted short-term annual crop. And this maintains living plant cover of the soil to enhance biological health, retain water and protect from wind and water erosion, and then livestock are often turned into the pasture to consume the annual crop as forage. Crop rotation is the practice of growing a series of different types of crops in the same area across a sequence of growing season, and it prevents the development of pest and weed resistance. And then cover crops are similar to, uh, have similar effects that, as crop rotations, and, but they're commonly used to suppress weeds and manage soil erosion, build more fertility and quality of the soil, and again, promote biodiversity. So uh, in this picture here, you can see a number of these things at play. Uh, in the forefront of the picture, we have the prairie species. In the back, we have some hedgerows and windbreaks. And um, in that field, maybe they're using cover crops. Who knows? But um, it's a good example of many of those factors. Can you switch the slide for me, please, Colin? Thank you. All right. So um, this is a case study that we're going to look at. This is the Ross Farm, which is in Granger, Texas. It, was, it is managed by Betsy Ross, and she started the farm in 1992 as a grass-fed beef operation. So she has 120 different paddocks of five to 10 acres each, and all of the paddocks house very different plant species populations and are managed very differently. But each paddock is managed to optimize soil organic matter. So this cow paddy offers a really fine example of biodiversity on Betsy's land. And as you can see here, it's a cow pat that uh, has some earthworm casting sitting on top of it. And then you can see the holes in the cow pat that are caused by dung beetles. So earthworms are the earth's intestines, basically. So their passages, the passages that they make are like super highways where water, air, roots, and nutrients can travel in the soil. And, and their excrement allows the conditioning of soil as well. And dung beetles both decre uh, will decrease both insect and pest populations that breed in animal feces and reduce animal disease by removing contaminated feces from the pasture surface and bringing it down into the earth. So they return nutrients to the pasture that would otherwise stay tied up on top of the earth in that cow pat. So I'm gonna try to turn the slide, there we go. Um, so we have here um, a picture of Ross Farm in 2011, during the 2011 drought. Now, Betsy experienced droughts in, in 1996, 2000, 2006, and 2011, which was the worst drought in Texas since the 1950s. So you can see here, there was a, there was a lot of um, loss of forage growth, but she still was able to feed her cattle through the majority of the drought. She did have to feed some hay at the end, but in, in the in the end, this was much, much better than many of her neighbors. So you can see in the picture on the right that the cattle had been in the pasture uh, on the right, right before, and were, had moved into the new pasture on the left. And while she did have to feed some hay, she was still able to last a little bit longer. So the next slide is from the Ross Farm in 2012. So this is one year later. And as you can see, the recovery from the drought was really quick to come. And Betsy equates this uh, to the building of soil organic matter over the years. So the more you have, the longer you can last during a drought and the quicker you're gonna recover. But that's given that you're practicing good management practices. Um, so uh, the next slide is from 2013. And I like to show this picture because you can see the variety of the plant species here. And this is important. She attributes the health of her animals to this biodiversity. So with a wide spectrum of nutrient consumption in the pastures, Betsy's cattle don't have to receive any antibiotics, dewormers, or other medications unless they have a life-threatening uh, illness or disease. And additionally, uh, 
for the past three years, people have come to do bird surveys on her property and they've identified 160 species of birds present on her farm. So one of Betsy's most famous sayings is, uh, mama nature welcomes everybody. And she really does uh, practice this on her farm. All right, I'm gonna turn it back over to Colin to talk about minimizing disturbance. All right, yeah, so the third soil health principle is to minimize disturbance, and that's biological, chemical, and physical. So some disturbance is actually good for your soil, um, but too much disturbance can be destructive for your soil, biologically, chemically, and physically. Um, examples of destructive disturbance include overuse of herbicides and pesticides, heavy tillage, overgrazing, and prescribed burns that aren't necessary. Uh, there is a sliding scale of disturbance in a lot of agriculture systems. Uh, we sit on the extreme end of disturbance, leading to massive soil loss, land deg degradation, and loss of ecosystem functions. So, in cropping systems, high disturbance tillage is, you know, the main mode of um, really high disturbance, and that is going to destroy your soil structure. These uh, practices include plowing, tilling with heavy machinery, or disking. Um, this soil structure um, that is being destroyed through these processes is important because it allows water and air to move through your soil. If you have a good soil structure, plants can easily access water and plant roots can absorb the oxygen they need. So this heavy tillage also kills the soil food web. Much of the food web is killed through the mechanical destruction, but also the lack of water and oxygen from poor soil structure. Included in this um, is mycorrhizal fungal webs. So mycorrhizae assist plants with water, phosphorus, nitrogen, and other mineral and nutrient uptake. It also helps hold the soil together as aggregates, um, including some of their slimes and gels that are in your soil. And they're also a major player in generating uh, humus which is our nutrient-rich organic matter of decomposed materials. This is also what leads to um, greater carbon sequestration. Um, that's taking CO2 out of the air and store, storing it in soils. So heavy machinery tillage used regularly also creates a hard pan layer of compaction. If you look at that bottom left hand, you can kind of see a plow pan and a disc pan and what they look like, and it's just solid. There's no pores in there. Um, when roots hit this hard pan, they're done growing. Your plants are not gonna be as big if you got a healthy soil structure. Also, heavy tillage destroys organic matter that is food for soil microorganisms like the mycorrhizae. Um, leaf matter and plant roots are chopped up and exposed to the surface, causing it to burn off very, very fast, especially in our hot climate, things burn off like fat. Um, and ultimately, all of these things lead to higher erosion. You have exposed soil that's no longer sticking together because the aggregates are destroyed, and it can be easily washed or blown away. So some solutions for cropping systems um, to minimize tilling, which is called conservation tilling, or no-till, which is the complete elimination of tilling, um, and you would have other uh, management practices in place to plant. Um, a fundamental practice in reducing tillage is going to be the use of cover crops and being able to incorporate these through no-till or minimal till practices. Uh, one such practice is strip tilling. So this means you alternate tilling in strips. One year you'll till and set um, a set of strips leaving adjacent strips untilled until the next year and then you'll switch off tilling last year's untilled areas. Um, though this is still, you're still committing a high disturbance activity, you're cutting the frequency in half, giving your soil a greater chance to rebound. Um, another conservation tillage implement is the reciprocating spader. And this implement that digs into the soil and actually kind of lifts the soil a little bit. So it'll cut in and then lift kind of like a shovel. And this doesn't destroy your soil structure and actually kind of, instead of vertically telling you, just, yeah, like I said, just kind of lifts and keeps those layers intact while cutting cover crops and, or weed roots. Um, another conservation tillage implement is the sweet plow, which basically drags along about one to two inches under the soil, cutting roots to kill either weeds or a cover crop that you planted. Um, it doesn't get into those deeper soil later layers, disturbing your subsoil structures. Um, the top layers of soil are more prone to disturbance, and so that's a little bit more okay than getting deep in there and messing with the soil layers. Um, so yeah, this one will also eliminate vertical tillage. So a final method I'm gonna talk about is solarization, and it's where you cover your fields with a tarp, and that allows seeds to germinate in a hot shaded environment, and then the weeds die because of no sunlight. This practice is be best in you know open fields like you see in the bottom right, 
and in the warmer parts of the month um, where it can really cook those weeds and any pathogens or weed seeds that are in that field. Um, the, everything in the subsoil will be a little bit safer. Um, so this gives you a great planting area to plant in. Once you're kind of done, you pull the covers off and everything is pretty dead on there and your subsoil will still be alive. Um, and it's great for also terminating cover crops after you mow them down. And so for livestock production, the main mode of over disturbance that's causing degradation is overgrazing. Overgrazing is basically having too many animal units and you're exceeding your land's carrying capacity and it causes lots of compaction to limits plant growth, just like in a heavy tillage scenario. And you're also letting them kind of go wherever they want all the time. Um, this leads to a diminished for su forage supply for the livestock, reduced water infiltration, and little to no food for microbes. As you can see, overgrazing leaves the land exposed and increases wind, or wind and water erosion and reduces the ability for soil to absorb rainwater. I mean, you look at that top photo and you can see a stark difference between something that's overgrazed and something that's been managed a little bit more appropriately. And so if you wanna manage livestock in a way that minimizes disturbance, adaptive multi grazing is the way to go. In this system, you keep livestock at a much higher density and move them anywhere from a few times a day or a few times a week, depending on the time of year and condition of each paddock. Um, this system allows the land to recover so there is adequate forage for the next graze and allows the soil to be covered and allows the land to perform the ecosystem function it's supposed to, like absorbing and holding water in the soil. You can set up these systems by using a mobile fencing that is electrified that can be easily moved. And you can also combine this if you wanted to break uh, your land into like fourths or something like that. You could break it up uh, using permanent cross fencing and then use the electrified fencing within there. Um, I think what uh, Kara showed earlier with Betsy's farm is a fantastic example of that. Um, and you could develop predetermined paddocks and create a grazing plan to move your cattle through. And the timing of this movement will really depend on season, temperature, rainfall, forage availability, stocking rate, and honestly your time as well too. That's a huge consideration. And now I'm gonna pass it off to Karen. She's gonna take us home on the last two soil health principles. All right, excellent. So now we're gonna move on to the fourth soil health principle of continual live plant, live root in the ground. So plants will transform sugars made from photosynthesis to a great diversity of other carbon compounds, including starches, proteins, organic acids, cellulose, lignins, waxes, and oils. So exuates from these living roots are the most energy rich of these carbon sources. And in exchange for these liquid carbon exuates, microbes in the vicinity of the plant roots increase the ability of minerals and trace elements required to maintain the health and vitality of their host plants. So you can see an example of how this works in the illustration to the right, where the mycorrhizal fungi is breaking down the parent material, the rocks in the, um, in the soil, and giving those back to the plant in exchange for water in those liquid carbon um, exuates. And so it's, again, that mutualistic symbiosis that we were discussing earlier. So microbial, microbial activity is also going to drive the process of soil aggregation around plant roots, which creates porosity, as we were discussing earlier. So aggregation enhances soil structure stability, aeration, infiltration, and water holding capacity. So glomulin and fungi contribute to large crumbs of macro aggregates in soil, which have a vital role in holding water, I'm sorry, in holding carbon and water than their finer aggregate counterparts produced by bacteria. And let's see here, moving on to the next slide. So um, some of the ways that we can ensure continuous live plant, live roots include the following here. So we can increase perennial plants Perennial plants return every year, and so a variety of cool season and warm season grasses ensure that the ground is continuously continuously covered with, with plants. And you can see this picture to the right 
Um, it was an exhibit at the Betty Ford Alpine Gardens, which showed how roots exist in soil. And you can see here these perennial plants, how deep their, their roots go into the soil, which is incredible. Um, if you can imagine the amount of microbial activity and, and nutrient and carbon exchange happening around those root structures, it's, it's kind of mind blowing. So another option is to use cover or pasture, pasture cropping, and that's going to ensure ongoing microbial life and continued nutrient cycling. You can also inoculate seeds when poor soil conditions exist with microbial uh, slurries so compost uh, slurries made from compost and other sources um, of microbial inoculation can introduce microbial life where it does not exist additionally the introduction of manure to the field or pasture is going to help provide soil organic matter it will also fertilize the soil for continual plant growth and it inoculates the soil with microbiology from the ruminant gut and uh, then creating diversity through crop rotations. So diversity of above ground plants improves diversity of below ground microbes as well. Um, here we have a picture of mycorrhizal fungi. And mutualistic symbiosis is the relationship where both organisms benefit, as we have discussed already, and mycorrhizal fungi fall into this category, which reduce plant stress, offers root protect protection and offer water and nutrients to plants in exchange for the liquid carbohydrates, energy, and fatty acids. So they can increase the nutrient and water uptake of a plant by 40% because of how they can spread their hyphae. So mycorrhizal fungi store water when there is ample supplies and they'll slowly release it during periods of drought. And fungi also make water when they decompose carbon materials such as carbohydrates. And mycorrhizal fungi can supply up to 90% of a plant's nitrogen and phosphorus requirements. An important piece of the microbial, uh, microbial function is to have a fungal to bacterial ratio of one to one, especially if you're trying to hold more water in the soil. It is the mycorrhizal hyphae and their long networks of, of uh, roots that allow for that water holding capacity in the soil. So additionally, rhizobium are soil bacteria that facilitate biological nitrogen fixation through the conversion of atmospheric nitrogen into plants available forms. So again, as soil carbon levels improve, so do the conditions for associative biological nitrogen fixation. And what you want to look for are pink nodules on the roots of legume plants to determine if nitrogen fixation is happening in the soil. If you take one of these uh, root nodules and you cut it open and it's pink inside, then nitrogen fixation is occurring. And if it is green or more whitish, then you're not getting nitrogen fixation in that nodule, unfortunately. So last but not least, uh, let's go ahead and discuss the fifth soil health principle of livestock integration. There's a lot of different grazing strategies out there, but some work better than others at increasing soil organic matter and thus improving the water holding capacity of soil. The picture on the right is another picture of Betsy's farm in 2018 when I was working there. And you can see a lot of forage. This is uh, July or August. So there's a lot of forage there. There's a lot of biodiversity and um, the cattle are very happy. So let me go ahead and uh, discuss some of these grazing practice, grazing management practices. And as we go through this list, the ability to increase soil organic matter and sequester carbon increases as I go down. So continuous grazing, the livestock are left to graze in one area for a long period of time and the pasture does not receive any rest. In rotational grazing, a, uh, there is more than one pasture that the cattle are rotated through and the pasture has a period of rest. In cell grazing, a system where livestock graze on small areas of pasture for a short period of time and are rotated frequently from one cell to another can maximize forage growth. And then in the adaptive multi-paddock grazing, which Colin already discussed, it's similar to cell grazing, but you have a higher stock density 
and you follow you it's followed by adequate forage rest and recovery periods and like colin mentioned there's no preset schedule it's based on reading the conditions of the land and forage and assessing the needs of the livestock and that's the most important thing is that you're always assessing the needs of the livestock and looking at animal performance in each of these different practices so when we integrate livestock especially through cell or amp grazing, we can help, that can help the pasture in the following ways. So we get to graze and trample the pasture residues, and this is gonna help fertilize the soil. It's gonna remove the, the residue cover for native seeds to propagate, to, or to germinate, I should say. It also will fertilize the land and increase the microbiome through urination and dunging. The urine of cattle is nitrogen rich and the dunging is full of different microbes from the ruminant gut. And you're also adding soil organic matter to, uh, to the mix there. All of these things will automatically improve the soil sponge. So litter on top of the soil becomes carbon in the soil, which is food for the microbes, but also increases soil organic matter. And then we want to increase perennial plant growth as well. Another reason for increasing that perennial plant growth, which often automatically happens when you start practicing cell or amp grazing. Uh, one of the reasons why we want to do that is because a more predominantly perennial pasture has a better fungal to bacterial ratio, and that's going to be really good for preventing erosion and mitigating uh, precipitation events and it will also help to store water like we talked about earlier. So another factor with perennial plants is that generally their vegetation will stay greener for longer and that's going to provide um, a better lifespan for your forage in both cool season and warm season. Many people who practice cell or amp grazing, they're able to increase their carrying capacity and some have even doubled the amount of cattle that they can carry on their property because they start the forage starts increasing and they start getting better forage value as well. And that in turn is going to improve the health of the cattle. So you will have less illness and often have improved gains. All the while you can be creating habitat for wildlife when you practice these grazing strategies as well. So I'm going to give a case study of one of our participants who has a trial in the Soil for Water program. And this is from a property called Texas Topia, which is located outside of Blanco, Texas, along the Blanco River. And it's the property of Pete Van Dyke, who owns Van Dyke Earthworks and Design. And he is a permaculture, he owns a permaculture consulting business. So they started managing the 13-acre Bermuda grass field on the left-hand side picture in 2017 and it had been managed for coastal hay for 30 years and it was very very hard and compacted so in the fall of 2017 they used a key line plow to relieve the compaction and without disturbing too much of the ground cover the first time using the plow they only got six inches deep so this allowed them to broadcast some cover crop seeds onto some of the lines of slightly disturbed soil but the first years, the first uh, year of cool season cover crops in 2017 unfortunately didn't do very well. The Bermuda grass was so thick that the cover crop seeds couldn't germinate and also the deer pressure was very high and caused problems as well. So again in 2018 they ripped and planted cover crops in the fall of 2018 and the second time they were able to rip down 12 to 14 inches which means that they were um, the soil was getting softer. So in the spring of 2019, they had a really decent cover crop of sweet clover and oats, and uh, it, the clover got up to four feet tall. And they were able to graze this using the neighbor's cattle, um, but they didn't get anywhere close to finishing the forage. Let's see here, Let's see if I can get to the next slide. There we go, you can see the, the clover on the left. So yeah, they didn't get anywhere close to finishing uh, the forage before it dried out. So Pete had to shred and take it down. Um, and then they uh, again ripped. And so you can see here, this picture on the right um, is after using the key line plow and mowing. But this time they only key line plowed in certain areas where they wanna plant trees to create silva pasture and they were able to rip down 20 inches. 
So again, more softening. And this is what it looked like in the fall of 2019 after mowing and ripping on the right-hand side. So because the cover crop, uh, because they let the cover crop get so tall, a lot of the Bermuda got knocked back. But you can see here in the picture on the left that some of it lived and they had their best cover crop yet uh, this year in 2020. And Pete was able to use a single wire electric fencing to keep the deer out of the field. And the oats and rye were able to grow back because of this. And in the spring uh, of last year, they got eight of their neighbors, I'm sorry, the spring this year, they got eight of their neighbors' cattle to come graze. And uh, in exchange, their neighbors gave them a thousand feet of two inch pipe. And so now they have a main, a long main water line in the field. And um, here is the cover crop on the right in uh, where they just grazed. So before they started planting the cool season cover crops, their field would be dormant for half of the year with no green leaves. And now they have green leaves and living roots for about two to, uh, for all but two to three months of the year, which is great. And they have a variety of wildflowers, various legumes, several different types of grasses, are starting to come back into the field as well. And so as they keep adding diversity and manage for green cover, they're gonna eventually shrink the non-green time down to zero months. Uh, they use uh, their legumes, they use sweet clover, black medic clover, vetch, winter peas, and for grasses, they plant oats, rye, wheat, brome, bermuda, little barley, and winter grass. So I'm going to turn it over now to Colin to talk about soil testing and soil testing labs. All right. So there are a couple of great options for you guys, especially if you want to benchmark and follow um, the healthier soil as that progresses over time and through different seasons. Um, one is going to be Haney, uh, the Haney test, and that is a great benchmark test for, and you can get soil respiration and the level of nutrients in your soil along with, you know, the typical things that show up in your to soil test, like organic matter, NPK, and all that. Um, that one is fantastic. And with this one, if you are trying are trying to benchmark, try to take it around the same time every year. And attached to that, uh, you can get the PLFA test, and that is a snapshot of the soil microbiology um, at that uh, time again. You know, with this, if you did it in the middle of summer, it will likely be lower than if you did it in spring or maybe later in the fall. These soil microbiology fluctuate depending on rainfall and temperature. So with that, again, try to make it consistent when you take that test. Um, another great test is your available water holding capacity. Um, and these three, this test and the two I just mentioned, the hanging the PLFA are tests we all take um, that are taken for the Soil for Water project for our participants. Um, these tests are taken once a year on a transect that is out in a field or sometimes multiple fields, depending on what they kind of want to uh, track and measure. We have a real kind of wide diversity of people uh, involved in the project. And that is going to determine how much water your soil can actually hold that can then be plant available. So that's a great metric to look in conjunction with the other two soil tests. Another one is gonna be soil infiltration. And you can see that double ring down there um, with Dr. Barbara Bells from Tarleton State, uh, as a colleague we work with, is uh, filling one up and that's more of a field demo. So the one she's doing isn't you know, necessarily exact compared to some of the more laboratory methods, um, but those cost about $5,000 and they're dual head pressure and they are awesome. But if you wanted something and just have something, you know, to see how it's doing and you can time it, that's a great option and it's good to see how you know things are working on your farm in your field and it's a good exercise just to get involved and if you want to kind of see compare versus compacted area versus uncompacted area um you know go up to a fence post that's been there a long time that's soil has not been disturbed i guarantee it for the most part and you could put the um, either a can there and fill it up and watch it drain and compare it to a compacted area um, so a couple, you know, a lab we work with and is awesome and we've been really gracious and all their help is Ward Labs. Um, they have the Haney and the PF, PLFA and the available water holding capacity test. They're awesome to work with. We can't say enough good things about them. And then AgriLife Extension, if you want that kind of traditional soil test, and they have other tests like heavy metals and things like that. Um, they're a really good, just basic soil test, I think. Um, less for benchmarking and seeing those improve, improvements over time, but if you just want a snapshot of some basic soil information, the AgriLife um, Soil Lab is great. 
So that we're wrapping it up now. I um, just wanted to make sure we shared resources with you guys. Um, at your publications, we have hundreds of publications on our website. They are all free now, so please take advantage of those. Download as many as you can, go for it. Um, those are all written by us, sustainable ag specialists um, nationwide. And then I also want to make sure we share our Soil for Water website with y'all. We have lots of great um, soil health specific resources and um, management techniques for soil health. Uh, on that page, and we also have a great video uh, on the impact of an ounce, and it kind of does an economic breakdown of um, the changes of, you know, a small unit of grass, and, you know, if you get each extra ounce you get from improving your soil health and improving your water holding capacity. Fantastic film. Highly recommend it. So, um, thank you all for attending. We don't sign off yet. We have questions coming up here in a second. Um, and here is all of our contact info. Kara's is on the left. That's her email and mine is on the right. Feel free to call us. Feel free to email us. We're here to help and answer any questions. Um, and if you can't, if you don't get this snapshot, um, well, it's easy to find us online. Um, okay, so let's go to some questions. Let me get these open here. All right. I, I've got them open, Colin, so I can start with yeah. the first one here. Um, do you suggest mulch or leaf litter to hold slash cover soil on a slope with few trees? How to keep native grass seed on this type of slope? So um, there's a few different ways that you can go about doing this. Um, in some cases, people will take uh, branches from cedar that they cut down and they'll kind of lay them along the contour lines of the slope. It's hard to prevent the seeds from sliding off, but if you create either, you know, the the, the brush or maybe put some also uh, round hay wattles there, you can you can hold some of those grasses that will butt up against those contoured um, uh, dams, in a, if you will, and will slowly begin to propagate back up the hill as well. So that is uh, one of the ways I suggest. I think that mulch and or uh, wood chips can be helpful, but if you have too much of a cover, you're not gonna get germination of the seed. So Colin, do you wanna add to that? Yeah, so another method I've um, seen, and I think this is in actually Saudi Arabia, um, which uh, drier than us, um, there is people I know that have actually created little rock berms and those have worked really well. Um, and then, you know, if it's a bit more invasive and costly if you wanted to do maybe swales and berms on contour, so you're slowing water on those slopes, that is an option. Um, that's a, a kind of a hefty conversation. There's a lot of um, considerations that go into that before you big, dig long on contour trenches. Um, but those are the main two, and I think you really hit it home with the other points. Okay, great. So somebody asked if we were making these slides available, and yes, we will be making them available. They will go on the ATRA webpage. Um, uh, I'm not exactly sure where they go, but I will be sure to, hopefully we can send them out via a link. Um, but if not, I will take your name and make sure that you get them. Um, additionally, we asked, somebody asked about the source of the biodiversity study, and that is going to be the University of British Columbia. It was the Food and Resource Economics Department, and I can email that to you too. I don't know what the exact name of the study is. I don't have that right in front of me, so I will be sure to get that to you. Um, let's see. Another question here is, does Texas Topia make an income from their farming? And I don't think currently they, they are. Uh, Pete's business is permaculture consulting, and I think that they plan on slowly uh, developing their land where they will be making an income from that, but currently that is, that is not the case. And uh, then we have here, uh, even a light hay application over seeds can help on low angle slopes. So that was just a comment to one of the other questions that we had there. And then um, how thick should mulch be, be applied? It seems that too much prevents water seepage. Colin, would you like to answer that or? 
Yeah, I can answer that one. Um, okay. so, so I hate to do this one, but it depends. Um, it depends where you are and what your goal is. If you're doing it, say, on a path or something, um, you can go pretty, pretty thick. Um, it depends, say, if you're planting some crops down. Um, I helped set up my buddy's farm in Oregon. A little bit different because they're more humid and a lot wetter. Um, he will, before he starts a new bed, when he was setting things up, he would plant a and about six to eight inch thick thing of wood mulch and uh, then allow it to break down for a year and then plant into it and you could stick your fist in it. Um, and on his paths, he's, he also does replies uh, mulch regularly and it feels like you're on a trampoline because the mycorrhizae mats that have been created, um, it's pretty weird to walk on it, honestly. And then um, it also depends on the material. So wood chips is going to be a little bit easier for it to kind of come through. Um, you know, the finer you get, like leaves, if you plant, uh, put a bunch of leaf mulch down, that can be really hard for water to penetrate. Or say if you're doing a small garden or a small farm you plant, um, you can actually use cardboard that doesn't have like packaging and labels on it. And it's just plain normal recyclable brown cardboard. Um, that can be hard for water to get through. So it really depends on your goals and what you're doing. Um, if, if, say, you're planting it around a tree, just a couple inches thick, um, after the, a little past the drip line, um, personally. Um, if it's on a, like a garden bed, I tend to like, you know, if you can find some organic straw or hay, I think that works pretty well. Um, you do have to worry a little bit about weed seeds getting in there. Um, but, or maybe a little bit of a finer wood mulch. Um, there can be nitrogen that is taken away, but um, if you're taking care of your soil and maybe you plant some nitrogen fixing cover crops, um, alternating, you know, there's some different things you can do. So um, I hope that was helpful. You know, that's kind of one of those nuanced um, topics. But if you guys have more questions about that, or maybe you want to talk that through with me a little bit more, um, feel free to contact me or give me a call. Great, thanks, Colin. Okay, so the next question, my backyard is xeriscape with yucca, cactus, and agave. Ground is covered with rocks, and under that, over the soil, is landscape cloth. I recently pulled some of the landscape cloth up in one spot, and the soil smelled wrong and looked dead. Soil here is hard limestone caliche. How to help the soil? So in this case, it sounds to me, since you're having that smell, um, uh, that there is just a lack of uh, aeration happening in the soil and and you might actually be holding water in there that's not allowing um, any movement to happen. There might be some compaction from the rock being on top of the soil as well and then with that uh, that cloth over it, it sounds like there's just very little air movement going into the soil there. So. Unfortunately, um, that can be very useful for preventing weeds from coming up, but not necessarily for helping um, with, with soil, uh, soil health. So um, obviously there's a lot of different ways that you could improve this, but I guess some of it would be uh, having to change a little bit of the design, the Xeriscape design. Um, by way of removing some of that rock or eliminating the um, the ground cover uh, below the rock. And I, one of the first things that I would suggest is, I, I don't think that much is gonna change unless you can change the compaction or the air going into it. So um, like I said, this is something that you can call us about and we can talk about in more detail, but it sounds to me uh, like the plants don't seem to be struggling. If the plants are struggling, then I would really, make some of those changes, figure out how to make some of the changes that would be helpful there. Colin, do you want to tag on to that? Um, yeah, the only other thing I could think of is, you know, getting some soil processes involved and in, uh, spreading some compost around because eventually some of those organic acids can dissolve some of the rock. Um, that's a really slow process, so you're not going to see anything, I mean, let's say five years, you know, it's, you'd start to maybe see some stuff, but um, that is one way to help with some of that, but, you know, I think what you said on the landscaping scenario, uh, moving some of the rocks, and if the plants aren't really suffering, you know, I think you may be doing okay, but, um, yeah, that's something I think, you know, we can answer more if we can find out more information. Um, some of these things, it's, it helps to see pictures and some of those things. Yeah. 
And our next question I'm going to direct to Colin. He is one of our cover crop experts in the uh, Southwest office here in San Antonio. So the question, Colin, is please give examples of cover crops to suppress weeds and increase soil fertility. Sure. So again, this is kind of uh, depends on your scenario and what you're working with. Um, if you're looking to, so there's warm season and cool season cover crops. And what you plant is going to be um, really depend on what your goal is. I mean, cover, suppressing weeds is going to be kind of a always goal with the cover crops. Um, you know, you just want to make sure you seed enough and get a good seed to surface contact. So there's kind of three main types, really. Um, there's legume species, and these will um, fixate nitrogen, which is basically takes nitrogen out of the air and makes it um, available in your soil later for another round. Um, you can use different grasses. Some people like the grasses, some people don't. Um, they tend to be a little bit cheaper compared to the legumes. Um, and also you're going for biodiversity again. Um, you get different root structures and things like that. And some of the um, cool season, like um, there's some rye species, some cereal rye that is allopathic to some weed species. So that is a great option. Um, but you gotta watch what you're planting after and maybe give it a little fallow time. And then you have some broadleaf um, species. So uh, mustards can be a great biofumigate if you're having some pest issues or like a pathogen problem like fusarium. And um, included in that is also be like daikon radishes. So if you have a really heavy uh, compacted clay soil, you know, that's something you could throw in and actually acts as a sod buster and can, has a really deep tap root and go pretty far down and break that stuff up. Um, you know, there's some people that tout max diversity, 12 species. Start simple, um, maybe one species. If you've never done it before, then let's try a couple, maybe one, two, three. Uh, three species is a great mix. I kind of like having a, a legume, a broadleaf, and a grass. I think that's a great diversity option. Sometimes I'll go for four. Um, so yeah, really just make sure you um, plant enough and there's good seed to soil contact. If you're doing it, say before livestock are coming in, you're trying to compete some weeds and doing it into pasture cropping. Um, if you have a no-till drill, that's great. Um, that can be like $100,000. So a lot of us probably don't have that. You could also just uh, do a kind of whirly bird seed spreader and have the cattle stomp it down. Um, I think if it's a smaller plot and you're competing for weeds in your garden, solarize them and then plant a cover crop down. Your goal is to try to kind of outcompete those in time. And some of, part of that is going to be the timing of the cycle and kind of interjecting and breaking that cycle so they germinate. And I think solarization is a great option for that. Excellent, thank you. Okay, and the last question that we have is what, if the, what is the cost for the Haney and PLFA tests? And those vary um, depending on which lab you use, but at Ward Lab, I think the cost for the two of those with the available water holding capacity test, I think we pay about 130 for the three of those all done together. And I think it's about 50 for the PLFA, 50 for the Haney, and uh, if you do that through Ward Labs, you not only get um, just the Haney, but you also get soil organic matter, soil pH, and some of those general things that you'll get on a, on a regular soil test, um, whereas if you went through um, the Agriculture Research um, Service where Rick Haney does his research and testing, uh, you won't get those things. So I like to have those. I think they're good indicators to look at trends over time. And so uh, I think if you go to the Ward website, you can check all these prices, but I think for the Haney and PLFA tests, you'd pay about $50 each. So, all right, it looks like that was our last question, Colin. So um, we really want to thank you all for joining us today. And please keep in mind that uh, the Soil for Water website does have an events page and we, we update that pretty regularly. So um, please have a look at it. And we are thankful that you joined us today and keep your eye out for other events coming up soon from the National Center for Appropriate Technology. Thanks, y'all. Bye-bye.